but Turkish people have a role to play. We know, they know that the masterminds are here, CIA slash NATO, the deep state, the Operation Gladio B. They know the network's head is here in the United States, and United States has been harboring this terrorist, this mullah, this ayatollah in the United States. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you in a special joint production with NewsBud.com. Today, we're going to be talking to Sibel Edmonds and Spiro Skouris about the topic that has taken over the news headlines over the weekend, and that is the attempted Turkish coup that uh, took place on Friday and was quickly quelled, but certainly has created a stir and is going to have polit- geopolitical ramifications in the coming weeks and months for sure. Uh, It's an interesting situation, especially because we were talking about it uh, six or seven months ago uh, here on The Corbett Report and on BoilingFrogsPost.com with Sibel. Uh, I wrote a newsletter editorial back in the beginning of December of 2015, uh, Is Erdogan Being Set Up for a NATO-Backed Coup? And then a couple of weeks later, uh, Sibel and I talked about that very possibility in an interview that we recorded towards the end of December. I mean, is it inevitable that Erdogan is being targeted here and that he's going to go down? And if so, how does that play out? Because they finally got to the point where they divided the country so much internally and the opposition. So he does not enjoy what he enjoyed two, three years ago. He still had the majority support. That support has been diminished is far below 50 percent now. And he's going to be replaced with someone much worse, I can guarantee you that because history repeats itself in these countries uh, with someone like his predecessors. And I don't know if it's going to be a direct military coup, but uh, the JHP, CHP party that, that, that are secularists, they, behind the scenes, some of the powerful factions within CHP, they have formed alliance with with Gulen movement, which is which is mind-boggling. I'm talking about the most secularist party forming alliance with the mullah, <laughs> uh, who is uh, who is ab- absolutely advocating for fundamentalism, Fethullah Gulen. I never thought I would see such day that these two will 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 force join forces, and uh, so you're gonna see something like that. And uh, but things are gonna get worse. Uh, we're going to have more terror events in Turkey. It's going to happen. Uh, and it's going to come from many sides. There's going to be the, the Kurdish sides. Then, of course, all the stuff that they are blaming on ISIS. It's it's going to be messier, but he's going. And Sibylle Edmonds was even more explicit in an interview that she talked, uh, she recorded with Lou Rockwell a little later on. You are looking at a country that is about to economically collapse any time now. And and your question was on Erdogan. And when you ask, well, what's happening and what's going to happen with Erdogan, that's going to be the major factor determining what's going to happen with Erdogan's administration. They have formed this date on November 7th or 20th for the election. But if this economic collapse happens before then, let's say by October, which is highly likely that it will it will take place, then you may look at the big major possibility of a period of pure chaos and uh, violence followed by possibly another military coup in Turkey, which will be the Operation Gladio and the rulers basically taking back the Turkish government. So perhaps this is not surprising, but it is interesting that the way this all played out. So now we're going to have to try to sort out what is actually happening in Turkey, what just took place, what is about to take place, and who are the real players here? Uh, who was really behind what happened in Turkey over the weekend and who is really in control at this point? Uh, it seems to be Erdogan and his uh, faction have uh, re- regained control, but we need to understand these events in a bit greater context. So let's bring in Sibel Edmonds to this conversation so we can talk about these events in more detail. 
All right, we are working obviously with a moving news story. So by the time that you guys see this, uh, who knows where this story will have moved on to. But at this point, we know that Erdogan is pointing a finger at Fatula Gulen, who again should be very familiar to viewers of uh, my conversations with Sibel over the years. And Gulen, of course, is saying, not me, Erdogan probably staged this himself. There are interesting elements pointing to, well, probably both of those possibilities being at least somewhat true, but I want to get Sibel's take on this. Uh, Sibel, let's start by breaking down the events of Friday. Your thoughts on the way this played out and how it either goes with or goes against the narrative that we're being told about this being some sort of spontaneous uprising um, by some uh, angry military personnel. Well, uh, thank you, James. As you just mentioned, the story and the facts and the storyline keeps evolving. And it has changed uh, to a certain degree since uh, Friday. But uh, as we see, it is changing on hourly basis. And uh, just a quick note, a lot of people have been making comments about, oh, I'm an oracle and, and I, I predicted looking at my crystal balls. But if they did listen to that interview we had, uh, to that discussion, they would see that we basically connected the dots. And that was a pretty much educated guess, educated prediction of where things were being led to. As you know, they started in 2012, 2013 with those famous Taksim Square protests were mostly designed by Gulen. And when we say Gulen, you're looking at an 80-year-old senile guy. He's just a figurehead. He is a station here in the United States. He's been in the United States since 1997. He lives in several castles. His castles are protected by security guard, Apache helicopters. His net worth for his NGOs and foundations for this Mullah Gulen is estimated uh, around 22 to 28 billion dollars. He owns and operates this terrorist, this Mullah Gulen, the largest charter school chain inside the United States. And uh, together with his CIA handlers, he's been establishing hundreds of mosques in Central Asia, in Caucasus, even in the African continent, in Indonesia. Uh, so, and he's been living in the United States while wanted in Turkey as a terrorist since 1997, okay? So those uh, protests were quashed, and after that, we saw this escalation, you and I, with all the propaganda during the elections, as the elections neared. So that was another attempt by the CIA, NATO, and Gulen faction to sway the public opinion and basically defeat or take Erdogan off power. That didn't succeed, despite all the trials, all the mainstream media propaganda, especially here in the United States, but to a certain degree with the English language version of some Turkish mainstream media who and the, with operatives who are linked directly to Gulen and the CIA here and all the think tanks that you and I have been talking about. And that was when I predict that, predicted that since the other attempts Failed, those would have been some sort of soft coup. The next step would be attempting a coup, a military coup. And Turkey is not unfamiliar. Turkey has gone through five coups before. And the 1980s coup was the biggest one. And the coup was implemented by United States, by NATO, using Turkish military, because Turkish military is mainly under United States and NATO, not on the paper, not according to the bylaws in Turkey, but that's how it's been for several decades, okay? As a NATO member, Turkish military takes their order, the military from US and NATO. So all the other things are kind of more cosmetic, election and presidents, et cetera. Yeah, they have some role within the internal politics, but when it comes to really big decisions, when it comes to really big implementations of big game plans, you're looking at Turkish military. So on Friday, we just found out through the Twitter and through the US mainstream media here that that coup was in play. 
And interestingly, as you would observe with many coups around the world, especially those implemented by military slash, you know, CIA deep state, they always take place at night. Why? Because they want to take advantage of the time of the day when people are in bed. So by the time they wake up in the morning, it's all done deal. Okay. Then they go about establishing curfew. And that usually lasts in 1980 when I was in Turkey. It lasted for three, four years in certain areas, the curfew, uh, until they established themselves. Well, this fits that particular pattern. And then, of course, we started seeing the scythe warfare. This was not present in 1980 coup in Turkey. There were no social medias. There were no Twitter. There was, there was, we didn't have any Facebook. But uh, Spiro and I spent that entire day in front of the monitor, in front of our computer, and we are checking all the information that is being poured into the social media channels, such as Twitter. And lo and behold, we see this tweet popping saying Erdogan has trying to escape the country. He is flying all over Germany, can't land. He wants to have asylum in Germany. The moment we saw this tweet, it was psych warfare written all over it. Because what would you like to do to demoralize people and make the coup successful? You either false information declare the leader dead, and that is amazingly effective because people get demoralized. They're saying it's a done deal. We don't even have a leader anymore. Or they say your leader ran away. He left you and he wants to go and get asylum in the UK or United States or Germany, which they tried to do. So at that point, I started chasing these tweets and saying, where is your source and where is the link? Where are you getting this information? To just show you how the faces of coup has change or the implementation tactic now, it's even in a way stronger, more multi-fronted because social media, as it did with Arab Spring, as it did momentarily when we were seeing that possible Iran Spring, use of Twitter and Facebook to help the coup succeed by spreading rumor, by mis uh, spreading misinformation. Well, it's it's very interesting, and you're absolutely right. And it, we have seen time and time again in countries like Turkey specifically, uh, social media being shut down uh, completely. And that is obviously going to control and influence uh, a lot. Now, these, these tweets that you were talking about, um, talking about Erdogan f fleeing the country and trying to seek asylum in Germany, uh, you you had called it, uh, right away that this was a, a PSYOP and it definitely appeared to be, it still appears to be that way. And uh, I had looked into the original source of this information and from the best that I can tell, the first person uh, tweeting about this is a guy named Kyle Griffin and he is he works for MSNBC as a producer and he, he tweeted out, this was mid-coup, that a senior U.S. military source tells NBC News that Erdogan refusing landing rights in Istanbul and is reportedly seeking asylum in Germany. Now, this was taking place as the coup was taking place, the attempted coup. There had not been any word yet from uh, Erdogan or uh, the, the government there. The, at this point in time, the, the coup plotters had already taken over the, uh, the, the press. They went in and took, shut down uh, the media outlets, and they were saying that they had declared victory, basically, at this point. So this, like, as you said, uh, was in injected. It appears to be injected at this key specific point to try to uh, stifle any kind of resistance to the coup. So it makes me question, well, who is this military source, and, and why, is, uh, why are they saying this? Why is M M MSNBC running with this, NBC running with this? And then before you know it, like you said, it was everywhere. It was being tweeted everywhere. And then the jokes followed. Oh, Erdogan's the first uh, Muslim who had been refused asylum in Germany and all of, you know, all of that. But uh, very interesting. It is interesting, but we can. And there were people who were actually tra uh, tracking his flight in real time on Flight Radar 24 or whatever that site is that shows that he really was circling around for a while and obviously not able to land. So something was happening. And it's interesting that, of course, that idea just gets floated and it seems to make sense. So it gets picked up and then 
rebroadcast out without anyone really checking what the source of that information is. I think, again, that is modus operandi for an operation like this. That, of course, raises the specter of the deep state and who was really in control of what was going on during those hours. And I think the most intriguing possibility of all of this is that the one that is now <laughs> is now being floated in the mainstream. And I, I hope we don't need to point this out for our listeners, but I think it's incumbent on us to point out the hypocrisy of the mainstream media that uh, the idea that this could be a coup that was staged by Erdogan himself in order to crack down an opposition is perfectly conceivable and allowable because Erdogan is on the hit list. He is a bad guy. But if this was an American American friend or ally. Oh my god, the idea. Oh, you're such a conspiracy theorist. What a crazy person you are. So, of course, this is an allowable conspiracy theory because Erdogan is on the hit list. But it is one that does have a certain degree of, if not uh, a ring of truth to it, at least it makes sense. If you are Erdogan and you know that there is a a faction that is plotting your overthrow, wouldn't it make sense to get ahead of that, to to stage or encourage uh, this little bit of the military to do this little show coup so that you can then crack down on everyone else, which of course is exactly what's happening now. Thousands of people being rounded up and uh, Erdogan probably has a tighter grip now than he has in years. So it does make sense from that perspective. Sibel, what's your, what's your feeling on this idea? Well, <clears throat> I would um, I would uh, distinguish between um, staged versus some foreknowledge, because Erdogan for the past three years justifiably have been trying to clean house, because as we have received this is documented facts a certain percentage of military has been infiltrated by CIA Yulan network. A very large percentage of Turkish police force, and this is over 20, 25 years period, people, that they have been infiltrations, has been infiltrated by Gulen CIA network. Same thing with the courts. And uh, every time he attempted, he being Erdogan, even with facts and evidence rounding up these people and removing them from the position, well, that was used, especially by the Western media and the, and the extension of Gulen Network, including many media organizations in Turkey that are still uh, under the control of Gulen movement. It became bad PR. He is being dictator. Look at this. He is removing secular thinking people from the military because he wants to bring Sharia law. Now, the real Sharia law actor for the CIA happens to be Mullah Gulen, the man who lives in the United States and gets to be every day more powerful, a man who is taking hundreds of U.S. elected U.S. representatives into fancy schmancy expensive trips. A man who go, goes and builds madrasas around the world, that's a Sharia man, CIA Sharia man, accusing Erdogan of being a dictator. And we have been watching it unfold, uh, James. This way, the idea, the notion, the rumor of the coup being staged was has been floating for quite a while. I would say close to a year. Even when I was in Turkey last year, there were people who were whispering. They were saying, with election, it didn't work. It didn't work with organizing protests. Basically, they're going to come like they did in 1980s, and we're going to have a military coup. Well, of course, they have had foreknowledge. How can you keep quiet, especially in a place like Turkey? In Turkey, we tend to talk, run our mouth, as, as our audience know with me. So uh, would, he be, would it be smart? Wouldn't you do it if you were in the position, James, to say, you know what? This is a perfect opportunity. Let them come in. Let us show the public what they are trying to do, who they are. And then without that bad PR, we can round them up and clean house. And uh, the whole thing is, though, if you were to ask me, so this is over, Erdogan won, it's under control. I would say definitely no, because this did not seem to be the scale in the scale of and the well-planned real coup. 
I think this was their dry run. I think this was a warm up coup. And the real big coup is still on its way against Erdogan. Maybe with this one, and this is a maybe, I'm putting a hypothesis label on this. Maybe it was to, you know, how you check the patient's pulse to see what kind of shape that person is. Maybe they're trying to really take the pulse of the nation to see whether or not they are going to really oppose the coup. Where is going to be the public opinion? Where is going to be the public stand? What kind of holes would be in the plan? So looking at the small scale of it, and in some ways, some sloppy nature that, that this coup carried, unlike the coup in 1980s, I would say this was the experimental warm-up coup to lead to a bigger coup. Now, in this case, the people in Turkey, they played a major role. And, uh, and that has been shown, basically, the enemies of, of, of Erdogan, uh, the, the, the Western countries, NATO, that it's not going to be that easy. I mean, you had these people, despite all the tanks, pouring out on the streets, listening to Erdogan saying, don't stay home, get out and fight it. Get out and fight it, because no matter how big of a military we are talking about, how big of an FBI Think about millions of people, what kind of power they would have despite the tanks and the guns. And the Turkish people, the supporters, the nationalists, they listened to that and they did exactly that. Now, this is in a way a positive thing to show because the Spiro and I, we were talking about this and we said, would we see similar kind of reaction in the U.S.? If we had a situation like this, or would people go with their little cell phone under the bed and say, wake me up or let me know when it's over so I can get out because it's so dangerous out there. I mean, 270 plus people lost their lives. These people actually, they climb these tanks. Okay, and they were not armed because they don't, you know, they, they, they don't have the gun rights in Turkey. So it was their fist. It was their arms. It was their, it was their determination to say, I'm going to put my life on the line to stop these coup, a coup that is being planned by the outside nations. And of course, as you just said, James, the way it's being portrayed in the United States is just amazing. Not amazing to you and I, but amazing that it is still being tried. Because imagine Americans. They, there is an outside nation that infiltrates this military and says, you go there and create this coup in the United States. We would want those people hung. We would want that nation to be nuked. And, 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 and yet they are forming and shaping the public opinion in the Western countries as here is a staged event by Erdogan and turning the tables <laughs> and they're making it about him being an evil. All right. Uh, the ne- the question about the next step, I think, is extremely important here, because as you say, if this was just a practice run or a warm up, then I guess the question is what happens between now and then in terms of cleaning house. And we are seeing thousands of people being rounded up right now. But the most important part of this uh, potentially is Gulen and what happens as you say, a figurehead, a senile old figurehead at this point, but still the the central part of the the, the faction, the CIA faction that's uh, that's working against Erdogan right now. Um, now there has been a lot of talk about Gulen extradition and calling for his extradition, but there has been no formal extradition call yet. At least uh, as we're recording this, the latest from uh, Stars and Stripes, Stripes.com, July seventeenth, uh, two thousand sixteen. Kerry says U.S. awaits formal request for Gulen extradition, saying that we have not had a formal request for extradition. This has to come in a formal package. Give us the evidence. Show us the evidence. We need a solid legal foundation that meets the standard of extradition in order for our courts to approve such a request. Is this really going to go ahead? Is is the Erdogan government going to make a formal extradition call for Gulen? And uh, if so, how does the U.S. counter that? And what's going to be the next step in all of this? Oh, wow. These were loaded questions, James. I will 
I will basically chop it in three segments in order to answer it comprehensively. As far as I have been reading, especially since 2013, Turkish Justice Department, Department of Justice Department in Turkey, uh, Adliye Bakanlığı, they have been sending all the things that are being requested by the FBI and the Justice Department here on Fethullah Gulen, okay? And uh, so, of course, the bureaucracy is playing, oh, they didn't maybe tick this box, uh, box so we're going to send it back, or maybe the signature was kind of faded, so we are still looking to authenticate the signature of the person who authorized this extradition request. That's the biggest bullshit I've ever heard. Turkey has been on the record demanding this man's extradition. Not only that, this terrorist Mullah Gulen, who operates the biggest charter school chain in the United States, has been under the FBI investigation for money laundering and all sorts of other criminal activities since 2009-2010. I mean, you are looking at an organization that is linked to so many different kinds of terror financing, money laundering, uh, and, and also extreme, spreading extreme ideas. They are operating centered in the United States. I think as far as the extradition is concerned, what we will be seeing is even if they say, oh, now we have the formal extradition request, they can sit on that and make it last for two, three years because they're going to give him an opportunity to appeal that. And then after that, to appeal that particular decision so they can drag it at least for two years. But I have seen and heard people floating the idea that his uh, health has been deteriorating, Fethullah Gulen. The more likely scenario is he's going to die. You know, he's going to have a stroke, be hospitalized or just die while all this extradition tango dance is taking place for show only between Turkey and the United States. But the most important point here is whether with Gulen's extradition being formalized, acknowledged by the United States or not, the real coup is not the one was that was tried, that we saw on Friday, it is not over. Turkish people should not let their guards down. They should not get comfortable and say, hooray, we have rounded up 2,500, 3,000 people. The number, when we are looking realistically for Gulen Network, including all the judges, including, I mean, you're looking at his own national security advisor that being the snake that they just arrested. It's far bigger than 2,500 or 3,000. But also, we should pay attention, close attention to other signs out there indicating the coming coup, the real stuff. For example, they just declared that out of the Injurlik NATO base, this is the securest air base on the planet. I would say it's even more secure than the ones we see in the United States. 42 helicopters missing. They walked out 42 helicopters from NATO's Injurlik base. And even though for the past half century, the United States and its allies, NATO allies, they have been keeping quiet how many nuclear warheads they have put inside the Turkey, okay? And it's not only Injurlik uh, military air base as they are advertising. Turkey has had nuclear warheads for a long, long time. Just like Israel issue, that has been always kept quiet. And the ones, the 90 plus ones, the NATO airbase is justified as NATO airbase. If you pay close attention, James, they keep floating now. You know, these nuclear warheads, what if ISIS gets there? Okay. Think about this airbase that has weathered the entire Cold War era with no penetration, no danger, right? All the Al-Qaeda stuff, the military coup, and before that, the anarchy period in Turkey. And now suddenly you see them advertising the importance of the nuclear warheads in Injurlik base in Turkey. That is significant. That is going to be tied to the coming coup because that would justify NATO and allies' action because they have to go there, remove Erdogan, keep the country secure so that we won't be nuked. That's what they're going to use. And where the heck those 42 helicopters are today? And how the heck can you take out 42 helicopters 
from one of the most secure air base in the world. So that's the kind of a BS line that they are selling the mainstream media to the people. But Turkish people have a role to play. We know, they know that the masterminds are here, CIA slash NATO, the deep state, the Operation Gladio B. They know the network's head is here in the United States, and the United States has been harboring this terrorist, this mullah, this ayatollah in the United States. And, and they can put pressure on Erdogan or facilitate his maybe already existing desire of playing tough, because Turkey can play tough. Why, did, why don't they shut down the U.S. consulates in Turkey? Wouldn't we have done that, let's say, in the United States, if it was, uh, we didn't we shut down Iran's embassy and consulates, declare them as an enemy working against the United States. They can put pressure on the United States. In fact, they should shut down the base and say it can't be operational. They can shut down the U.S. consulate. And there are enough Turkish people here that can actually assert some level of influence. They know where his foundation's quarters are, Gulen. They are trying to implement warm-up coup and then the big coup. I mean, Turks, uh, they, they can be in some regards very brave. And they can actually come and take their own man, put them in a big crates and take them back in, in, into Turkey and hang them. But there are things that people can do in Turkey, and it's time for them to get tough and just go beyond talking the talk. We have those brave people who truly put their lives on the line. These people, it's not political ideology. It was saying we are not going to have foreign powers coming and implement coups here in our country. But I think okay. the point is Erdogan's never going to do that. Erdogan's never going to kick the U.S. out, never going to close down the embassies. He's never going to withdraw from NATO. Uh, this is, I mean, if he was going to do that, he would have done it by now. But the people can. I mean, think about this. He, what, okay, let's say this is a short-term victory for Erdogan. Well, who brought this victory for Erdogan? It was the people. It was those people that they put out on the street. So if Erdogan is not going to do it, Turkish people, and I will tell you, you may be seeing it two days from now, they can go and shut down the embassy. In fact, the embassy people will evacuate. Because when this is what's happening directed towards Turkey, I don't think the United States embassy or consulate has any right to exist or operate in Turkey. And that would be the public opinion in Turkey. If Erdogan doesn't shut down, at least maybe he would stand on the side and watch people do it. Okay? Maybe it's time for helicopters to go and evacuate the personnel, including the CIA personnel, directing, facilitating this warm-up coup, kick them out of the country. Okay? Can they do that? Of course. You know, they keep showing the Iran hostage-taking situation. They never show what the United States they did to Iran via its embassy and, and its CIA headquarters for Iran being stationed in the embassy. That is being censured. That's never talked about. Well, the same thing. Many of the CIA operatives, many of Gulen's handlers, they operate in Turkey. So Turkish people can go shut down military attache in Ankara, the embassy, can they do it? You put out there 15,000 people, and I will see how fast they are going to run for their lives. It would make some interesting parallels for the uh, Jimmy Carter of 2016, a.k.a. Barack Obama, to end up with a hostage crisis at the end of his administration. I don't know. It's very interesting. I have no idea whether this is likely to, to play out this way, as you say, but it is certainly something that is possible, as you say, because it was... It really was the people that really did make the deciding difference on Friday. Um, and you're right, if they had just cowered under their bed and waited for the morning, things might look very different in Turkey right now. So uh, I guess you, you certainly have a point there. All right. Uh, is there any other points that you or Spiro would like to make before we start wrapping up here? I know Spiro has a couple of good points on all the links between Fethullah Gulen, and, and, and I'm going to let him address that. We were just sitting and reading up on Fethullah Gulen's foundation and his connection to Clintons, both Clintons, Hillary Clintons and her foundation. But there are enough Turkish people here. I know some of them are Gulen supporters, but there are Turkish people in the United States. I would tell you that 
This guy, Fethullah Gulen, he's, he has several headquarters because he has several foundations and NGOs. They are here in the United States. And as FBI has declared, they are under investigation and they can show some muscles and they can demand their own demands, Turkish people, to go after him here. So they are not extraditing this man who is already criminally under investigation by the FBI. They may be take notice, taking notice of some people going and targeting Gulen's facility in the United States for a man known to be terrorist. And I think... U.S. would have a hard time while it's investigating this terrorist, this mullah, to say that, okay, we are going to protect. He's not even a U.S. citizen. So that's something that people should not disregard because their elements are active out there. They can raise their voice and their presence, people here, and target Gulen's facility. And I also would like to issue this call for all these annoying parents who are sending their children to a charter school operated by worldwide renowned terrorist Ayatollah Mullah, who is most wanted, okay? So you're looking at a sanctioned bin Laden to a certain degree because some of these madrasas, as we spoke about this, James, they are also training camps for terrorists, whether it's for Chechens or for some other factions that now they are pouring into Syria. Before that, they were going and joining Al-Qaeda in the Balkans. And remember, Operation Gladio B started 1996-1997. This was during Clinton's watch, okay? This was not during the Bush or Obama watch. This operation started in 1996-1997. And Fethullah Gulen was brought in with a CIA Gulfstream planes while he was most wanted in Turkey into the United States in 1997 under Clinton's watch. He was harbored as a terrorist, even though Turkey was a NATO ally, by Bill Clinton and Clinton's people. So people really need to take note of these facts because these are documented facts. Just go and check. We have covered it. We have provided the links. And I would let uh, Spiro finish up with the many links of Fethullah Gulen to Clinton uh, and Clinton family. Well, I, I think I, you covered it pretty well there, Sabelle, actually. Uh, the Clinton foundations and Fethullah Gulen's foundations uh, have been working together, throwing money at each other's way. And it's just another example of how uh, these families, and like the Clintons, these dynasties, have, have been around for a long time, and they have their hands in everything uh, behind the scenes. And, and this woman uh, is getting is running for president in this country, in the U.S. And so it just it's uh, alarming to me. Uh, the it just says a lot about the state that this country is in, and how these people essentially are above the law and. Uh, uh, Gulen and the Clintons and, and many others are, are perfect examples of that. And they, they're working together. Um, and these agencies are involved and they're influencing uh, or trying to influence uh, other countries and what's taking place there uh, without considering the, the residents of those countries. Uh, they're, they're irrelevant. So uh, they're just going to push uh, and, and keep pushing. Uh, and the military industrial complex is going to uh, continue to gain. Uh, you know, we see NATO and everyone, and of course ISIS. Next, we're going to hear that ISIS is behind the attempted coup in Turkey. I mean, what's next? So uh, they they want boots on the ground in Syria, and and they're going to going to keep pushing. So it's uh, we'll we'll have to see. I'm sure a lot more is going to unfold here pretty soon. Well, that is obviously uh, correct because again, what happens in Turkey has ramifications throughout the entire region, and also, of course, what's going on in Syria. And so there are a lot of different uh, different agendas at play here. And as I think Sabelle rightly points out, the nuclear issue is going to be the, the one of the main cards that's played. I've certainly seen it played numerous times this weekend. Now they're suddenly talking about nukes in Turkey, where they haven't talked about that, that uh, for decades and decades, but suddenly it's an issue. Clearly, there is some some ma major moves afoot in the region. And obviously, this is going to be playing out in the next uh, few weeks and months. Even the next few days could be extremely interesting. So we'll be keeping our eye on it here at CorbettReport.com. I'm sure at Newsbud.com also. So people can stay tuned for uh, uh, updates there. Anything else you guys would like to say before we say goodbye? 
My condolences to the families who lost their family members, loved ones during this uh, less than 12 hours coup attempt. And uh, again, I would like to repeat that people are not powerless. They have shown it times and time again in, in Turkey. And uh, they, of course, can expect and demand the authorities in Turkey to act upon this and shut down U.S. facilities in Turkey until until they get satisfactory results and get these people back up. It's their sovereignty and Turkey's sovereignty, any nation's sovereignty needs to be respected. And if they don't get that, I believe Turkish people have to take it into their own hands and say, okay, we are going to go and shut down the enemy camps because that's what we would declare. We would call them M enemy camps. And currently the role the US mainstream media is playing and the United States government is against the interest of the people, people's democratically elected, whether we like Erdogan or not. I'm not saying I am in love with Erdogan. It is people elected him. That was people's choice. You don't respect it. Shut down the United States embassy. Shut down the United States consulate. Shut down the think tanks because that's another place where they harbor, and I know exactly which ones they are. We will talk about it. The CIA operative. Many of them operate through attache consulates and the U.S. embassy, but many of the NGOs, especially the Soros-funded ones, they do issue, get issued diplomatic passports and they funnel CIA operatives into Turkey so the Turkish people can take it upon their own hands and go and shut down these hornet's nests and start doing it. Demand it. If your president, if your parliament is not doing it, you take it to your own hands, into your own hands, and shut down these institutions until they respect your sovereignty. All right. Well, that's uh, quite the rousing call, so we'll leave it there. Spiros Garis, Sibel Edmonds, thank you for your, uh, for your information, and I hope people will stay tuned to Newsbud and Boiling Frogs Post for more updates. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now available from CorbettReport.com. The Data DVD, Volume 4. Every podcast, interview, episode, and article published on CorbettReport.com in 2011. All on two Data DVDs. For details or to buy other Corbett Report DVDs, please go to CorbettReport.com slash shop.